You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hello, it is Ryan, and I was on a flight the other day playing one of my favorite social spin slot games on ChumbaCasino.com. I looked over the person sitting next to me, and you know what they were doing? They were also playing Chumba Casino. Coincidence? I think not. Everybody's loving having fun with it. Chumba Casino is home to hundreds of casino-style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere, even at 30,000 feet. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com to claim your free welcome bonus. That's ChumbaCasino.com and live the Chumba life. No purchase necessary. VGW. Void or prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way to go. It's a long way to Tipperary. To the sweetest girl I know. Hello everyone and welcome to History of the Great War episode 178. This week I would like to thank Stanley, Peter, Craig, Bradley, Julian, Ronald, Glenn, John, Thomas, and Thomas for supporting this podcast on Patreon, where they get access to special perks, like for just $1 a month ad-free episodes at $5 a month special Patreon-only episodes. If that kind of thing sounds interesting to you, head on over to patreon.com slash historyofthegreatwar to find out more information. While the war in Europe ended on November 11th, it would continue in other parts of the world for just a bit longer, as news of the armistice spread around the globe. The last German commander to learn of the armistice and surrender would be General Latov Vorbeck in eastern Africa. Back on the Western Front, the fighting wrapped up quickly, although there was some ambiguity about whether or not it might restart later. Remember, this was just an armistice that technically didn't really end the war, just caused a pause that could have been restarted later, even though the possibility was very remote and it didn't end up happening. Batan would send a letter to his troops on November 12th that read, quote, I am touched like you by the memory of our dead, whose sacrifices have given us victory. I salute with sorrow the fathers and mothers, the widows and orphans of France, who have stopped their tears for a moment during these days of national joy to applaud the triumph of our arms. For all of the countries involved, the big and the small, it had been a long and costly war. Today we will be looking at some of the immediate aftermath of the conflict, with the German troops returning home to a burgeoning revolution, and the German fleet surrendering to the Allies. We will also spend some time looking back at the war with a whole bunch of numbers, really, really big numbers, that represent how many lives were destroyed by the war. Then we will look a bit at the post-war world by talking about what happened to some of the military leaders that we followed along for four years. For all of those wondering how these random bits tie together, well, they don't. As with most series of episodes on the podcast, this series ends with a bit of a grab bag of random but still very important topics that didn't find their way into any of our previous episodes. After the armistice took effect, the German army had to be out of the territory that they had occupied in Western Europe in just a few weeks. This meant that they started pulling back pretty quickly. In many ways, the movement of the units back to Germany was the last coherent act of the old German army, and what they found when they arrived back home forced them to change and to become something very different. What they found was a country on the verge of revolution. In many cities, revolutionary groups had seized complete control. These revolutionary groups came in many different forms. Many were socialists, some were Bolsheviks, uh, others anarchists. But regardless of their specific cocktail of beliefs, they all wanted one thing, big changes in Germany. What they were met with was a large set of Germans that did not agree with their worldviews, and many of these Germans came from the army. The German soldiers who returned home would form together into a variety of units with a variety of names, and they would take it upon themselves to bring control back to the cities, well, to bring their control back to the cities. This was not a simple process, and it involved no small amount of violence. In cities all over Germany, street fighting broke out between the two groups. Berlin, Dresden, Munich, and countless other areas saw fighting in the streets. In these clashes, the soldiers were victorious, and they brought the cities back under the control of the central German government. 
While the danger of revolution had been avoided for the moment, these socialist uprisings and clashes between the soldiers and socialists sowed the seeds within German society for future actions. Among the hardcore German nationalists, the pre-existing hatred of socialism, and Bolshevism especially, was just inflamed. And with it the extreme anti-Semitism that was also already existing. Much like in Russia, in Germany, those that were the hardest anti-socialists believed that the socialists, and especially the communists, were supported by Jews within Germany. It was not a good situation, and it would only get worse over the coming decades. As part of the agreement for the armistice, the Germans had agreed to surrender their fleet to the Allies, their entire fleet. That included not just all of their surface ships, but also all of their U-boats. And the Allies made it clear that no U-boats would be returned to Germany under any circumstances. The fate of the German surface vessels was a bit more up for grabs, and at the time it was not certain if the Allies would keep all of them, or just a portion, or maybe even none. The French and British wanted to split them up amongst their own fleets to bolster the size of their naval forces. The Americans didn't really want any German ships, but they were also not huge fans of their allies being given so many free warships. There would be a good amount of discussion about the fate of the German ships at Versailles, something we'll really dig into in later episodes. The first ships to be surrendered to the Allies were the U-boats. There were 194 of them in service with the German Navy at the end of the war, and on November 20th they began the lengthy process of surrendering. The U-boats were instructed to move to a rendezvous point in small groups, where they were then met by groups of British destroyers. Once the two groups of ships met up, the British prize crews, which consisted of two to three officers and 15 enlisted men, would board the U-boats and take command. Each of the U-boats would then be moved to Harwich Harbor. Uh, after they arrived, the Germans would gather all of their personal belongings and be moved to transport ships that were waiting to take them back home. It would take 11 days of this process being repeated over and over again before it would be complete. At the end, 176 U-boats would be surrendered over to the British, with the rest either, ha either having been unfit to sail or having sunk along the way, although no men were lost in these sinkings. The U-boats would stay in British hands until the details of their future were determined at Versailles. While the surrendering captivity of the German U-boats went quite smoothly, the surface fleet would have a somewhat different experience. To start with, the Admiral in command of the High Seas Fleet, Admiral Hipper, refused to lead the fleet when it surrendered, and so instead Rear Admiral Reuter was in command. He would be leading a procession of 70 German ships, 9 dreadnoughts, 5 battle cruisers, 7 light cruisers, and then a whole bunch of destroyers. They would proceed to the Firth of Forth, where they would be surrendered to the British Grand Fleet, and from there they were transferred north to Scapa Flow in small groups. Once they arrived at the flow, all radio equipment was removed, and the crew sizes were reduced. The ships had arrived in British waters with their full complements, somewhere north of 20,000 men, and this would be reduced over the coming months as several thousand sailors were sent back to Germany over the course of December 1918. When the new year came, there would be less than 5,000 men still with the ships. As can be expected in such a situation, the discipline among the ships, stuck in Scapa Flow with nothing to do, was not the best, and there was a strong sailors' council that had a good amount of power. There was also a lot of drinking, a lot of smoking, and not a whole lot of anything else. Even though they had been peacefully surrendered, Admiral Reuter and his highest officers were never really big fans of giving their ships up to the British. There was also, technically, a standing order within the Imperial Navy that a ship should never be allowed to fall into enemy hands. Citing this order, Reuter, even without communications with the German government, decided that allowing the ships to be boarded and surrendered was something he simply could not do. And so on June 17, 1919, he began to plan to make sure that it did not happen. A very detailed order was written up and secretly distributed to all of the captains, saying, quote, all internal watertight doors and hatchway covers, ventilator openings, and portholes are to be kept open at all times. End quote. On June 18th, 2,700 more men were sent back to Germany, leaving less than 2,000 men on board the ships. All handpicked men ready for what came next. The code word that would begin the plan was a signal. Paragraph 11. Confirm. 
At 10 a.m. on June 21st, Reuters sent out an order that all ships should be ready to receive signals from the flagship, and at 11.20 a.m. the signal was hoisted. Paragraph 11. Confirm. At exactly noon, all of the ships hoisted their Imperial Naval colors, and the ships began to go down. All but one of the dreadnoughts and battle cruisers went to the bottom, half of the light cruisers and 32 of the destroyers. Their officers had opened them to the sea, and the water had rushed in rapidly. The British were shocked that it had happened, and the French were furious that it had been allowed to. The Germans were quite pleased with themselves, even though nine German sailors had been killed and 16 others had been wounded by gunfire from the British once they realized what was happening. Scheer, after hearing the news, was quite pleased, saying, quote, I rejoice. The stain of surrender has been wiped from the German fleet. The sinking of these ships has proved that the spirit of the fleet is not dead. This last act is true to the best traditions of the German navy. I've come to consider the sinking of the fleet as the last action of the war in Western Europe. It would be the last time that the old German army or navy would come into conflict with the Allies, even if it was mostly bloodless. There would be further scuffles between the Germans and the Allies in the 20s, but those would be quite different, led by different men and for different reasons. This was sort of the end, June 21st, 1919, with the German fleet sinking themselves. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com GW50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less, it's that easy. One feature of many of the podcast's episodes has been a section near the end of a series where we discuss numbers. Often in my notes, that section is just called numbers, and it exists to just give an overview of casualties. Well, now we come here at the end to the largest numbers section of the war, because it's about the entire war. The war had been going for 52 months, and one thing that you can do with very large numbers that we are going to talk about here is start dividing those numbers by the time scale. If we take the highest level number we have for military deaths during the time of the war, it's about, you know, 8.5 million to 10.8 million. And then if we add in directly attributable civilian deaths, we end between 15 and 19 million killed during the war. If we start dividing that number by the time scale, just taking the low end of that estimate, so we're looking at uh, 15 million, we arrive at 288,000 per month. 
9,615 every day, almost 400 every hour, almost 7 every minute. That's 7 people dying every minute for 4 years. And that does not even include the deaths caused by the Spanish flu, which we'll discuss next episode, or events like the Russian Civil War, which would add millions more. We can also break up those numbers by country, with Russia having 2.8 to 3.3 million dead, the Ottoman Empire 2.8 to 3.2 million dead, Germany 2.2 to 2.8 million, Austria-Hungary 1.8 to 2 million, France 1.7 million, Italy 1 to 1.2 million, the British Empire 1 to 1.2 million, Serbia 750,000 to 1.2 million. Romania, 580,000 to 650,000. Bulgaria, 190,000. Greece, 175,000. Belgium, 140,000. The United States, 117,000. The impact of those numbers, as gigantic and almost mind-blowing as they are, even goes beyond just their numerical values when you start looking at them by percentage of population. We'll take Serbia, the most extreme example, with 750,000 to 1.2 million people killed by the war. Now, this barely breaks the top 10 in terms of total deaths by country, but it comes to almost a quarter of their total pre-war population, a quarter, 25% of its people. In many other European countries on the list, the percent would be around 4-5% to of their total pre-war population. But even that does not tell the entire story, because those deaths would not fall on the entirety of the population equally. There were specific generations that would be hardest hit, the worst being those born between 1890 and 1895, who were 19-24 to when the war started. In Germany, this cohort of men would be reduced by over a third, and in other countries, the percentage would be very similar. A huge chunk of an entire generation destroyed in most of the countries of Europe. Those that had been born later, and maybe did not reach military age during the war, were still affected, especially in Central and Eastern Europe. In these areas, the mortality rate for those under the age of 15 would skyrocket due to the economic problems caused by the war. Malnutrition would be the norm, not the exception. In many of those areas, 1918 also represented not the end of the war, just the middle chapter before local conflict took over. And so here I am at the end of this giant paragraph of lots and lots of numbers, but I just want to reiterate that top line number again. 15 to 19 million people killed during the war. 15 to 19 million, that's a very large number. Please don't forget it. While the post-war conflicts in many regions of Eastern Europe were just heating up when the Germans surrendered, for Western Europe the war was over, and so I think it's appropriate to take a moment to check in on some of the military leaders that we have followed over the years. In many cases, these men, while they would not disappear from the history books, would soon take a backseat to the politicians. Generals like Foch, Cadorna, Konrad von Hotzendorf, Joffre, and von Falkenhayn all retreated from the public stage, and they would spend a good amount of the rest of their lives working on their memoirs, many of which did not provide much historical value. They were, shall we say, biased. Haig would be too hated by Lloyd George to play a large role in post-war Britain, and so he would spend the last decade of his life raising money for veterans of the army. In many ways, the ones I've talked about so far, they're the happy stories. Others, like Ludendorff, would tarnish whatever good record or recommendation that they had generated during the war. After his return from exile in Sweden, he would become involved in efforts to topple the Weimar government, and with later efforts being in conjunction with the Nazis. After 1925, he would go even further, taking on views so radical that even the Nazi party would not associate with him. Hindenburg would take a different path, running for president in 1925 and then for re-election in 1932. During his tenure, uh, he was even more of a figurehead than during the war, and his story would end in 1933 when he was persuaded to name Hitler as chancellor. In my opinion, the saddest, although I bet there are those out there listening right now that would disagree, story of all of these generals is Patan. 
Patan was already in his 60s in 1918, but at the age of 84 he would be called back to the service of his country and asked to form a government when the German army was once again invading France in 1940. He would arrange an armistice and then form a new French government in Vichy, one that collaborated with the Germans. He greatly feared that his departure would have opened up France to even worse treatment, and other French leaders did not agree with his course. When the country was retaken by the Allies, he was put on trial and sentenced to death, a sentence that was reduced to life in prison by de Gaulle. Patan would die in 1951 at the age of 95, a hero that had simply lived too long. Before we end the episode today, I have to admit that I've made a mistake one that I intend to rectify right now. You see, in episode 177, I was planning on giving several quotes from soldiers about the war, three specifically, and they got lost in my notes and so did not make it into that episode. I consider them good enough and important enough that I'm going to just add them right here, right now. They are a bit out of place considering the topics of this episode, but I think it's worth it. In all three of them, the soldiers talk about their memories of the war and how it changed them, in both good and bad ways. We start with Ernest Wintmore, an American soldier of the 5th Division, who would return to the United States on a stretcher, with gas-scorched lungs and shrapnel in his legs. Quote, There was no glory. Instead, it brought to him a wounded body, and memories of sights that will always cause heartaches and tears. It brought him hardship and exposure almost beyond man's conception, hunger, cold, and sleepless nights, the sight of mangled bodies of friends and buddies, the knowledge of desolation, and the sorrow and agony that is the aftermath of war. It left him with memories that can never be erased, memories that bring again and again visions of an eternity spent in a hell on earth. Here is E.R. Hepner, a British soldier. Quote, Four and a half years have slipped by since 1914, and I go back to make up those lost years, lost in one sense, yet gained in another. For have I not learnt to realize the sterling qualities in my friends, learnt a little more confidence in myself, gained a wider outlook on life, and learnt that might is not always right? I draw a curtain over times in which there have been many glimpses of sunshine through the thunderclouds, and I look forward to the happiness of peace. Finally, we end with Private Francis, another British soldier who even has a message for any historian, reader, I guess podcaster, and listener when discussing the First World War. He would say, quote, I have read many books about World War I, written mostly from the point of view of the officer class, most of whom, in my opinion, above the rank of lieutenant colonel, should have been suffocated at birth. For God's sake and common humanity, do not write about honor and glory. There was none. War, especially ours, was a stinky, ugly, horrible business. Please treat it as such. I am no angel, and I do not suppose I ever shall be one. I joined the British Army in 1914, aged 18, a sensitive and patriotic boy. I left some six years later a bitter old man, but, by the grace of God, whole in body and mind. One item that I've been talking around for a few weeks now is the Spanish flu. I wanted to spend some time discussing it in detail, and that time comes next episode. Hundreds of thousands of soldiers would be affected by the influenza pandemic, and millions of civilians around the world would feel its effects. And we will dive into that story next episode. I hope you will join me.